joined today with Sarah Green. Oh, bye. Joined by? Joined by Sarah Green. Gosh, my grammar is great, Sarah. This is going to be fantastic. Yes. All the words. Going to be <laughs> We have, about yeah, we have too many words and so it's really hard to know which ones to choose. Um, my biggest thing actually at the moment, which has nothing to do with this, is that Rod has picked up. Well, first what happened was my daughters started coming to the table occasionally and using the words particularly and regularly. And he was like going on this whole thing and mocking them and like for the way that they were saying those words. And I was just sitting there getting quieter and quieter and more awkward and realized that actually it's because I say that. And so now I'm trying to retrain myself to say particularly, particular, partic particularly, and regularly, because it feels like it should have regularly. It feels like it should have it at the end. And so I say it, but it's not correct. Yeah. My mum always used to say Pacific, not. Oh, Pacific. oh my gosh. That's one of my pet hates, but I know people who do it. Yeah. And um, people who say, uh, performance instead of performance. Yeah. So I'm married to a total pedant because he's English and clearly they created the language and they we just did. ruin it, right? And so <laughs> there is constant correction going on in this household and I am always wrong because I am not the English person. No, I I, will, I am generally the wrong person too. So I, my mum's, we always say it's because my mum's English is a second language because she was Dutch. So I just use that. Even though mum mum came here when she was 11, I just use that as my excuse and it's all okay. Right. So um, so anyway, so we're um we're not talk we're actually not talking about that today, um, everyone. Sorry for jumping in, but I realized I was I was making a mistake, so I had to diffuse it with humor. Um so I'm Rachel Claver and I'm a marketing coach, and I've asked Sarah to be part of this live today because she's actually coming and teaching a masterclass uh, to my clients and to other people who are coming along. Um, in a few weeks on May the 7th, all around how to maximize your time and not allow activities that we are doing all the time, really future steal from the power of what we're doing, like maximizing our time without burning out, I think would be the thing, wouldn't it, Sarah? Absolutely. Because you, you can work harder out of the problem, right? Like yes. Work longer and harder to get out of it, or you can do it in a slightly more sustainable way. I like sustainable. I like easy. Uh, that will be the ADHD in me. <laughs> But if I can find an easier path, I'm going to choose it. So I'm I'm a big believer in this. But one of the things that we came up with this while well, we were talking about it that made us want to do this today was that um, Sarah has got, I have virtual assistants and I have assistants to help me too, and I'm a big believer in it. Um, and But Sarah's got, and I'm going to name it. It's okay if I say her name, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Sarah's got a. This, but... Okay, she hates it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Dolly. Um, so Dolly is um, Sarah's VA, but I would call her a mind reader. She's a magic maker. And I know to get a mind reading magic maker VA, yes, occasionally you get someone who just is a magic person that way, but you have to know how to work with that person to get them to that stage. And so I was asking Sarah, how did you get into that stage? And Sarah and I both discovered that we'd both made mistakes when we first started working with VAs. Mm -hmm. And so we thought we'd talk about that and maybe Sarah could share how she's created that magic because, yes, Dolly is amazing, but it's the relationship that you two have and, and the systems that you've put in place that's made that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So before we do that, tell us about you, Sarah. Why, why, are, you, why are you you? What do you do? <laughs> So I'm a business coach. I work with women in my programs as part of the Moxie movement to get them to six-figure success while giving them back a day a week because I don't believe in the you need to make seven-figure sales or eight-figure sales or not whatever the latest cool thing is. I believe that you need to figure out what you need for your life mm -hmm. and what works for you. And then you build your business around that. And the six-figure success I'm talking about is not about sales at all. It's about what's left over at the end of the day for you. So I mm -hmm. want you to have at least a six-figure salary. Yes, you should get paid for the work you do in your business if you're working in your business. And I want you to have a six-figure profit. But I don't want you to do that by working 100 hours a week because that's possible because I've done that. Yeah. So that's what I do. I really like that too because I get quite frustrated when I see people talking about turnover and and I it doesn't really count for me. I've worked with people who have a three or four million dollar turnover and are making pretty much no profit or about to go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And then I've worked with someone who has done a hundred and twenty thousand dollar turnover and is making eighty thousand, ninety thousand dollars profit. And so yes, they're different business models, but which one of those would we term a successful business? 
isn't it the one that's actually supporting you and creating that stuff? And, and, and what point do we say, hey, wonderful turnover, but when are we turning a corner on this and actually seeing some money come out of it, which is is the sign of success, right? Yeah, and I think there's like value in startups and this magical creating mm. something new out of nothing. I really do think there's value in that. But I think we've over glamorized this, you know, scale these businesses big, millions of dollars, really, really fast often at the sacrifice of other things and the thing that I find most with ladies uh, we are really good at sacrificing us and the things that matter to us above everything else mm. and without that sustainability around the relationships that matter most to you you're going to end up uh, miserable in a business that is looks successful from the outside and it's not gonna be fun and I've definitely I had that I you know I grew a business that had a big team and somewhere on the long way went from me being able to pay myself to not being able to pay myself at all and and having to crawl back that and redo it you know I, i'm really pleased with where i am now but there was a lot of heartbreak in there and i wish i had actually built it more thoughtfully i also do think that that startup thing is such a toxic culture for most businesses because it teaches this idea that we can't actually have profitability right from the first go and yes some things like you know you've had restaurants sometimes restaurants you've got a lot of capital that you've got to put in. So sometimes there isn't profit right away, but the model itself should have a profitable model so that there's at least money to repay that capital right away. Oh, and let's be honest, hospitality as a general rule doesn't have much profitability. No, it doesn't. I mean, it's probably a bad it's example. <laughs> you know, it's a example. Stress, it is a terrible example. But, you know, like in terms of service, at least straight out service base, if your service based business isn't making profit from day one, there's a problem. You can't make more by getting bigger. Like there's no corner that you turn at any point. Yeah, and I would say the same, like just you've just got to look at it slightly differently when it comes to product businesses, right? Mm. If I'm selling one widget for yes. $1 and it costs me $1 to make, there's no point in scaling yeah. it, right? Yeah, exactly, so, that's how I feel. I know there's like scale comes, mm. like cost savings come as you get bigger, but selling a 1,000 widgets for a dollar that cost you a dollar, like it's never going to get any better mm. than that. Yeah. So you've got to, you, the, I think there's elements of both. Obviously, then there's, you know, fixed costs and things like that we have to take into consideration. But make sure there's money in that for you. Yes. Right in the word go. It's so important. And you can get back there. Yes. Like, okay. So we've talked, we know that the thing has to be profitable. But yeah. one of the things that we talked about is that to create the time for you to grow your business and to have time to think straight, to get all the bits and work in your zone of genius and actually do the things that you did best that you wanted to set your business, you may need to get some, well, we not, we both, well, I'm not going to say may, we believe you need to outsource stuff. And it might be as simple as outsourcing the dishes to a teenager, for example. I said that to someone yesterday. They said, oh, maybe I should teach my teenager to do the dishes. Yes, you should. <laughs> like they should be doing the dishes. So, but Along the way, a virtual assistant can really help, like mm -hmm. or someone who's doing admin and things like that. Yeah. I, I think the thing here is that fundamentally, if you're doing everything, mm -hmm. you don't have a business, you have a job. Mm. It's a hard thing to hear. One. Yeah, it's so true. It is so true. So um, you've got Dolly, who's amazing. But did you have, was she the person you started working with first when you first started getting out of out? Oh, absolutely not. I've been through multiple virtual assistants and, and all of them have been really awesome. Like, yeah. let's just be clear. It's, it wasn't them, it was me. <laughs> okay, same here, same here. So, so why did you initially decide to use a virtual assistant to help you? Oh, this is really old school. I remember reading Tim Ferriss's... Oh, yes, the four-hour four workbook. Work Okay, it is old school. I will actually tell you before you tell you, but I read the book and I only read the first 10 chapters and didn't read the rest of it. And it changed my life so much. I never read the rest. I didn't read the rest for 10 years later. And then I was like, I missed out on all this other good stuff that I could have also done. Yeah. So I was reading it, yeah. I don't know, 10 years after he wrote it going, yeah. oh God, it's still relevant today. Oh God, I still yeah. haven't done it. So there was kind of a little bit of that. There was also this, um, I, we'd lived overseas, so um, I knew that we could pay someone really good money overseas mm. who would live a great lifestyle. So yes. just to be clear, Dolly has her own business as well. <laughs> I, I thought she has just recently bought the property her business uh, operates oh, in, like freaking awesome. epic, like yeah. it's super cool, right? So the money that we pay them allows them to do things that they otherwise wouldn't mm. be able to do. 
I also find there's just a cultural difference in that they uh, really enjoy working with people that are doing great things. I find, and this is not everyone, but I do find that tall poppy piece that we have in New Zealand mm. and Australia is kind of, you bump up against that a bit. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was a co- there was some cultural thing. I read some stuff, made my life easier. Um, we weren't in a financial position to be able to pay someone thirty thousand dollars a year to do our admin in New Zealand, but I could mm-hmm. find ten thousand or twelve thousand dollars to pay someone o- overseas to do it. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of those conversations. That's where it started. Mm-hmm. And because I I'm a big believer in you know um, I've got clients who use New Zealand VAs I've got clients who use overseas I do both I've got both New Zealand and um, and overseas VAs and mm-hmm. I say you know there's nothing there's a difference in using both and that both is valid and sometimes price is a factor if you've got a lot of admin work that needs to be done and there's a price point factor there isn't that is an option is to actually look at that outsource work and find someone who's absolutely loves it and thrives in doing it because that's going to make everyone's life better so i'm i also have outsourced help from philippines and also from vietnam Mm -hmm. um because it it helps my business better and those are aspects that i have as well as my kiwi support so yeah yeah and i think it's we don't live in a world where our businesses operate just in our location anymore like we live in a global world that globalization's been and gone people so thinking about the field of employees only being available to those that can walk into my office and sit down here Mm. and have a conversation with me is super limiting for your business Mm. uh, super limiting for your life and you do not just that you meet some really cool epic people in epic places I mean you don't want to go to the Philippines and meet their team like that exactly which is pretty cool yeah we actually think that we've also got a team of developers in India so we do we've we've got quite a quite a global group so what did you initially decide to outsource like what are some of the tasks that you thought those are going to be my primary ones and we'll ask in a minute whether the right ones but what what did you initially think oh this is what I'm going to get rid of yeah so I think we have to go back because I had five businesses at the time so Sarah today and Sarah Crazy, crazy lady, five crazy lady at a time. Yeah. I suspect I'm probably still a crazy lady, but you know, I was just working too many hours back then. Yeah. And so I think we had five businesses at the time. Um, I did some work with a business coach, surprise, surprise, uh, <laughs> in Australia. Uh, and he went, Why are you answering your emails? Why are you managing your calendar? Why are you dealing with all these small requests that someone else could do for you really, really easily. Mm, and mm. you're spreading the love, Sarah, spread the love. And I went, mm, and, he was, and this particular person was like, you really have to have someone that sits next to you. And I yeah. was like, okay, well, we'll do that. And so that was my first point of call with admin was that I had someone come directly and work with me alongside me. Um, it worked okay. Um, mm. I think what I found was I became the bottleneck because we were yeah. working alongside each other versus often there was a stuff that I needed to do before they could do it. And so there's kind of this delay. And so that's where the international stuff was really helpful um, because, you know, Dolly will be coming online now, kind of middle of the day. Mm. I've already had the morning to run at some stuff that if I need her to do some work, she can do it. When I wake up in the morning, it'll be done. Mm. Um, so there was that benefit. So the, it was basically stuff that, you start off doing because it's cheaper to do it yourself. Yeah. And you say things like, it's free if I do it myself or yeah. it's faster if I do it myself. And you find yourself doing it every day or multiple times a day. And you recognize that actually it's not a good use of what you're supposed to be doing. And so yeah. those are the things I outsourced. So emails, posting on social, creating social stuff, um, you know, sharing rosters, scheduling appointments, like mm. all of the business admin. And let's be honest, even some of the life admin stuff that just yeah. really come in and go into my calendar and didn't need me was kind of the first stuff I started with. So it's interesting when you talk about that cheaper to do myself, because I often think it's like, um, I every time I hear that, I have this visual picture, like it's really clear of, I used to work in early childhood facilitation, and one of the things I used to teach was like, yeah, it's actually easier for you to do your children's shoelaces or to pack their bag or to do those things. It's so much easier until you're doing it five or six years later and you think about all the time that you've spent and it's the reason we do it is it's not so much that it's easier to do it myself, it's easier than the pain 
of teaching someone and getting them competent in it is I don't want to hit that or face that. Do you think that's accurate? Yeah, absolutely. It's that discomfort. It's I'm not sure how to teach them. I yeah. don't know what I'm teaching them because it's just second nature to me. Like tying my shoes yeah. is second nature. But if you ask me to teach someone how to tie it's their shoes, it's hard, right? Yeah. It's the same in your business. All of this stuff we do is often second nature to us because we've done it thousands and thousands of times. It's an, yeah. almost an unconscious process. And now you have to deliberately slow down, stop and think about what you do and go, how yeah. can I show someone else all the steps? And you miss steps and you have, mm. there's all sorts of problems with that. Yeah, because I found that that was my biggest block was because I messed up with a couple of VAs before I found the people I've worked with in this. In it. But my biggest thing was I would go, I need you to just do this thing. And then they would either not do it right or they wouldn't do it to my standard or they would do it, they'd not do it because I didn't understand. And then I'd get annoyed with them. But it was my fault because what I had to do is slow myself down and actually work out what the process was, document it, video it often, so that they could see it. Because quite often too, what I could see wasn't what they could see because they might not have the right access or something like that. And so I had to learn to slow down and just put procedures and systems in place. And that st that one painful thing stopped the bottleneck and meant that I never had to do it again, but I had to acknowledge that that was something I had to do. I couldn't just say, you go work it out yourself. I had to do that step. Yeah, because we say things like, oh, it's just common sense. Just, you know, just everybody knows how to do this. Yeah. And the reality is it's common sense to you and I, because again, we've done it lots and lots of times. Yeah. And I feel your pain and the, I've just got to slow down. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to slow down. I just want to keep going. And I've got this person and they're here to make me go faster. And why don't they read my minds? And that yeah. was absolutely me. I was like, I remember setting one task. I can't remember what happened. It was a random opportunity that required a CV. I haven't had a CV <laughs> for a really long time. And I was like, cool. I want this person to update a CV. I gave them a template. I went, please update this with all my information and sent it over. What I hadn't said was, you need to delete all of the information that's in here. And some mm, of the information could yeah. have been my stuff, right? It yeah. talked about some accountancy background. It talked about how old I was. Like there was some in the template that I'd used was some stuff that could have been me. Mm. So I wasn't explicitly clear. And so it came back kind of half ass done. I was like, man, what a crappy job they've done. Yeah. Now, in hindsight, because, you know, you can see everything as you get older and wiser, <laughs> now I look back and go, oh, that was a Sarah problem because yeah. I didn't care about what we were doing and how we were doing it. Yeah, and I do think that that's some of the things that I, um, I've i definitely learned myself as well. Like, that's the stuff that I struggled with and realised that it wasn't the person. It was definitely me, and so getting that structure is great. And I've found, too, that I've had a couple of times where the person's left and I've just been able to slot someone else in because the instructions are so good. So it's helped me in terms of like going, just have a look at this stuff. If you don't explain, come back to me. And that's taken that off. Can I ask something about, because I know that we talked before about previously, and I've mentioned it here, but how Dolly is kind of your mind reader. She can second guess now and kind of know what you're doing. Do you think that, um, how have you got her to the, got her, and I know she's her own person, so I don't, it sounds, I don't want to sound condescending this way, um, but how do you think you guys have got that relationship now where she feels that she's confident to go and be proactive in areas that she knows. Like, what do you think's happened there? Well, she's actually the boss. It's not me. Yeah, I think that's how I see it as well. That's because I was I was wondering because that's ha that's been the turning point for me. I I tell my people I'm your bitch, which sounds terrible, but I'm like I'm your bitch. If I'm holding you up, you need to tell me, but give me lots of notice so that I can get it done. Yeah, I'm always going to be the hold up. Yeah, I'm always the hold up. I'm always the problem. Yeah, it's me. I'm 100%. Hi, it's me. I'm yeah. the problem. It's me. Yeah. Taylor Swift and me totally got that one right. <laughs> yeah. I, so how do we get there? So I think the very first thing is um, I believe, and again, this stuff's old school, but the systems run the business and the people run the systems. Yeah. There is no other way to do this. That doesn't mean that we don't still have to be really deliberate about who we pick. Yeah. So I don't pick people that can do the tasks. And that's where I went wrong with my VAs at the start. Mm. I was like, oh, look, there's thousands of people out there that are really good at creating social media content and can craft me a really grammatically, is that how we say it? Grammatically. 
grammatically, that word. Yeah. Uh, or as I would say, grammatically. <laughs> Um, a, a grammatically correct email address and mm -hmm. look they can format things and they can drive canva better than me and they can drive wordpress better than me and they can awesome give me 10 of those people i'll interview them which one do i like yeah. and i'll employ that person now you're not ever going to have a problem finding someone who can do the work mm -hmm. uh, do the like task follow through on the hey i've got the skills to do it and if people don't have the skills, it's really easy to train them in it if you've got the systems and processes to mm. do so. What's really hard is to find a great values fit. I'm so and, with you on this. Yeah. So there are two sets of standards in every organization, whether you think you have them or you, or you don't. <laughs> One mm. is a set of operational standards which is what we're talking about when we're talking about systems and processes here's how sorry here's what we do here's the 10 steps here's the video that shows you how to do it that's the operational standards mm -hmm. and then on the flip side of that you have the behavioral standards here's how we're going to behave while we're doing these things here's how we're going to interact with each other so if you don't have a sense of humor if you don't think family is important if you don't uh speak your mind if you don't tell me when i'm an idiot like those standards that most of us assume people implicitly know, but they don't. We assume they're common sense, but they're not because every organization mm. has a different set of behavioral standards. Every family has a different set of behavioral standards. If you don't have those explicitly clearly and you don't put them front and center in your recruitment process, you will always have problems because you can train develop and support someone to follow the operational standards you cannot fix a behavioral standards mismatch with that as easily now i'm not going to say you can't ever do it i'm just going to say it's much much harder because particularly if you've employed them because they excel at operational standards they're like why should i change i'm a great mm -hmm. salesperson i'm a great accountant i'm a great virtual assistant why do i need to change yeah, I absolutely love that because I know that um, out of my last, because I've got an in-house admin assistant as well, and one of them um, was not was so lovely, like, honestly the loveliest person. But as I said before, one of my key criteria is they I have to, they have to understand that I'm their bitch, which I do actually say it that way to them, and I say um, I your job is to make sure I have you have everything from me. And it's not my job to have to hold that because I'm giving you that job. Because I think that's one of the things I had to learn was that one of the benefits of having an assistant is you don't have to have in your head, you don't have to hold space in your head for all that admin is it getting done. So yeah. I'm like, if it's if I give you that job, you own it. And if I'm holding it up, you make sure I do it. And she was just honestly is the loveliest person that probably walks this earth but it meant she was terrified of saying, hey, you need to do this. And so she wouldn't come back and say, you haven't delivered this to me. And I need, I need that. And I'd say, be mean to me. I don't mind. You need to say, this is due. Where is it? Because I'm very good at dealing to deadlines. And it was a constant issue with her. There was nothing wrong with her attitude to wanting to the work or her quality of work when she did it. But she couldn't get that 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 felt so abrasive to her mm -hmm. that she would have to tell her boss what to do that she really struggled with it whereas the other the next one no problem no problem you know so and i would be interested to know what you changed on that journey because i know what i changed so i wasn't psychologically safe for my team no. in those early days and what I mean by psychologically safe is I was unpredictable and how I would react when they told me that they needed me to do something yeah. because I was stressed and under pressure and all, yeah. all the excuses under the sun. The reality was I hadn't done enough learning or upskilling of myself to, to mm. show up in a really predictable way for everyone. And so they weren't sure when they made a mistake or they asked me to do something, what Sarah was going to show up. And yeah, I, I was definitely... Yeah. I definitely know that when I had my big team, I was psychologically unsafe for that because most of the time I'd be okay. But if they got me in a day where I was like really stressing about profits or the sales were down or something like that, I'd be like, you're just adding to my freaking stress right now. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn to go, that's actually not your problem. And I could do that now, but I definitely didn't do that back then. Yeah. yeah. And, and then so that makes it hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and i think it's 
really interesting because we have this kind of dynamic where we're like, a virtual assistant is the solution. Uh, employ someone, it's the solution. Outsource that, it's the solution. And there's so much work that we have to do on ourselves yes. in order for that to happen. And it's not a magic, they're not these magical unicorns that come in and will ask for you what you need and mm -hmm. show up and hold you to account if you don't create the right environment for that to happen and so the yeah. behavioral standards and that psychological safety are really really important like golly has made plenty of mistakes just like me because we're both yeah. humans and yeah. that's the very first place that we kind of start like if you can't own your mistakes you can't come to me and say sarah i stuffed up i got that wrong and i'm like that's cool how do we fix it Mm. that if they don't feel safe to do that I'm doing something wrong and that definitely was the place especially for those of you that are going to go offshore to get mm. uh, support you've got to uh, be aware of the cultural differences as well they don't like to show that they've made a mistake and women no. in general often don't want to either like it's a very scary thing so you have that combo um i would say too that i um because i'll often refer virtual assistants to people i've referred new zealand based ones to my clients and i've also referred offshore ones to my clients as well and i'll often have a conversation with them and i'll say things like um please treat them with respect because they're a person don't treat them like a servant because i think that's really important and i've had a few disappointing moments where that person's come back and said that person's really like flown off at me mm -hmm. um a couple of new zealand based ones actually where i've gone i'm really sorry um that person is a bit complex you know so that's happened but the other side is i have said things like culturally if there's any cultural difference culturally you need to be really specific about what you want or the desire or you need to give them a really clear framework because otherwise they're going to interpret it this way. And I think it's really important to understand that, that if you're getting subpar, if someone's getting good results from from a VA and someone else is getting subpar, the difference is not that, per, is, the, is the customer. Mm. That's yeah. the difference. Yeah. yeah. And it's a really important memory, memory is that we have to make sure that we are taking ownership of that. Yeah, and so there's some things you have to put in place, right? If you don't know what the values are, what the behavioural standards are of your workplace, of your mm. business, of your organisation, then you should probably do some work on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That yeah. And we so many things, but in, particularly for this. Yeah. You also need the systems. Like you can't just go do this thing, take care of my emails, uh, update my website, like load my blogs without a process around it. Mm. You need both of those pieces before you can give it to them. I some of the things that I uh, maybe we could talk about some of the things that we have developed for this. Um, I know one of the things I did is I've got uh, one of my assistants. It's my podcast person actually. Hey Vera, lovely, love you. Vera Vera's very highly creative and very good at what she does. Vera and I have a thing in common where we sometimes like to go right to the end degree of our timelines. And in fact, I'm doing that for her this week, which I which I don't normally do. But when she does it, it drives me crazy. Hi, Vera. Um, and so I have it that my another assistant reminds her because it stresses me out. So she reminds her if it's late, it's a task for her to do. And that's a really good way for me. I've learned that removes that thing of me sounding agitated. I'm the next level up. So if she doesn't reply to that, then she gets an agitated email from me. Yeah. But I that has been a learning experience for me. So I've created like systems within my VA system. Yeah. But I've also, the other thing that I have found has been really useful for me is actually having a like a, a, a video and a step-by-step -step process in writing that means that it's consistent so that if they forget how to do something, they've got a task kind of like a how-to have you yeah. done something similar yeah so uh there was, there was a couple of things that just popped up yes yeah. I've absolutely done things similar the other thing I always look for now in myself and in other leaders and businesses I'm like how we show up is always reflected in what other people are showing up so yes. when me, I've got a problem with people being late yes. I'm always looking around at the leadership table going who's who's the chronically late person here so I'm one of those people that goes hard up against deadlines all the time yeah so i don't normally for podcasts to see yeah. i normally am like six weeks yeah, yeah. but this particular week i am so yeah. i feel very bad because i'm saying this on this here and she's like dude like the, you tell me it has to be here on wednesday but this is literally on wednesday i'm getting it like this is not fair that's literally the first time it's happened in two and a half years of podcasting yeah so i've never done it before but i i so i understand the process 
yep. of going to the deadline. So I understand it, but it also stresses me out greatly when it happens to me. <laughs> oh, look, absolutely. And so those are some of the things that I'm really aware of now with working with, mm. it doesn't matter whether they're virtual or in-person humans. No. Like yeah. how I'm showing up is going to reflect on, it's going to reflect through everyone. Like yeah. your business becomes a reflection of you. So that one's really important. Uh, yeah, we success map. So um, I'm a total nerd now about my systems. Uh, when, when did we go and do it? Scarlet was three. So I'm going to say nine years ago, uh, we went to the States to work on some automations with the, a software called Infusionsoft. And the people oh, who yes. had this way of doing it just like for all the marketing pieces in the business and using this particular tool. And I was like, oh, and I went back and I did all the marketing pieces and all mm. the stuff. And then I was like, we could do this in the whole business. And so now I use those frameworks and I put them That's across cool. the whole business. And I have a map of what does my business look like when it's completely systemized? And then we build out each system. And it's really timely that we're having this conversation because my call with Dolly last week was literally, I'm sorry, the success map is so out of date. It needs a massive overhaul and a massive update. It's not that the systems behind it are broken. It's just that I haven't looked at where is all the pieces and made sure everything's up to date in the map that tells us where everything is. So yeah. we this map. That's about being really clear about what are all the parts that make up our business. We build a system for each one of them. And it's also the way that we organize all our files. Like I'm totally geeky. All our files, we organize our Asana on it. Like it's all of that process is away. And that's what I teach my people to do as mm. well. So that it's logical. So that when you yeah. go, you need to find that marketing piece. It will always be in two dot marketing files. Always. <laughs> oh my gosh, I would hate that so much. <laughs> I have a really good system, but as soon as you add numbers to it, my brain goes la 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 la. It's such a weird thing. I've got such a because you're an account. You got you started a business as an accountant, like you started as an accountant. So <laughs> I know I shouldn't shouldn't tell people problem, but but you you're okay with numbers. But I have this weird thing that if you have a number in the code, I don't want to. I, I can't do it. So I do a very similar set. like I'm very structured. But the minute there's like a two point or something like that in, I'm out. Isn't that so weird? Totally. But I've got clients like you too that we're yeah. just hilarious. And I can tell that they're clients like that because their success map comes about. It's all pretty. And so it's like, yes, like sales is a color and marketing is a That's color. That's me. But that's me. <laughs> I do both. So I like yeah. follows up with my numbers, with my like I can imagine. I can but... imagine you will because that would make it so it's like when I do spreadsheet stuff and I'm like, oh, this is quite a good spreadsheet. And then it goes to our my group and one of the um one of the clients, Kate, comes back and goes, So I've made the spreadsheet better. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like it's just yeah. I think that it at the, what I'm saying, I agree with you that you have to have the systems map. I just love that. I merely went, oh no, numbers, I can't do that. But I have the same, like, I I think you have to have a systemized approach to it. Otherwise, you're going to get overwhelmed in business. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I found is having it really visual. So yeah. the other thing that I think about is we all process information differently. We all learn things differently. We all communicate differently. And so I've worked quite hard to go, I'm going to tap all of those ways of learning and using information. Yeah. And so I want to make it visual and I want to make it so someone can listen to it. And I want to make it so someone can touch it and do with yeah. it. And, you know, all those things. Because I have a much greater understanding, not just of how, because I just used to do it all the way. Sarah wants it. Yeah. There's other humans involved, right? And so my way of doing it, which would mean that nothing ever got finished. But my way of doing it isn't going to work if I need other people to come through and execute on the stuff behind me. Okay, so I love this because I was mentioning before I've had a couple of different VAs and the one I had previous, the one I've got at the moment is my core admin person. Her favourite way of learning was for me to do a video and she'd watch the video and do it together. The current person I'm working with, she can't do that. She just does, she's a block, she doesn't like it. So we've moved to having, and I know you and Dolly have regular meetings. Yeah, Most of our learning is actually in those meetings. And I had very little faith of that because I also need video. I prefer to have a video walkthrough so I can remember because I don't listen when someone's talking to me. So I don't have that. Like if someone was trying to explain, I'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's like having directions. I'm like, cool. I got turned left. I didn't, I stopped listening after that. Like I don't listen. So I didn't have that capacity and I didn't trust it at first and I was like okay we'll just see how it goes that's how you're telling me you learn best so that's how we're doing it she's incredible and I only have to show her or walk through it once and she's got it 
And it goes so far against how I would have taught it. And we still have the video and the and the and the details there for other people. Mm. But it, it made it just was a real reminder that yeah, you do have to teach in the way the person learns. You can't just go, this is the way we're developing our system and deploying it to you. You've got to really adjust it. Yeah, and I think it's fascinating that people like you and I who do this stuff for a living, like we yeah. teach and coach and support for a living and so when you and I are designing to go and run a workshop or go and yeah. do something live somewhere that's exactly what we do we go oh cool so my visual people will need this and my I know people will need this. and then we'll have to get up and do an activity for those people and yeah like, we actually that's what we do for a job and then we come to doing it in our own businesses and we go oh I just forget all of that yeah it's a really interesting thing for me because it is really important you know I think if the message isn't getting through, is it the listener that's the problem or is it the person talking? I always remind, that's what I always think about. And I go, you know, you might have one person in a hundred who doesn't get it. And so maybe it was not wrong. But if it's if it's a group or if it's the person in front of you that's, tr that's you, you're paying to do the job, it's your job to make sure that you're understood. It's not their job to try and change the way they learn. Yeah. And so I think it's really interesting is that communications like, I send a message, you receive it. Yes. But there's a third step that we always forget, which is that checking for understanding, mm -hmm. checking I understood. And the responsibility sits with you, whichever part of that communication relationship you're in. There are times when I send a message to Dolly, written, audio, whatever, and she goes and does something, and I'm like, dude, that was me. I didn't check that what I said was clear and I didn't check that it was understood. Now, that's the only bit I'm in control of. Yeah. Uh, Dolly's in control of, like, I need to check that I understood that the way Sarah wanted. And so mm. getting to that place where Dolly's like, yeah, what do you, like, this is what I've done, but can you, I, I'm not 100% sure what you meant by A, B, and C, has been getting to that, again, it comes back to that psychological safety. Yeah, yes. Sarah, you weren't clear. What do you want me to do now? And, and that, that can be cultural too, right? Like that cultural thing of I don't want to question you because it makes you sound like maybe I don't trust you, but actually it's important to get that clarification. Yeah. And so yeah. It, you're just building on this all the time. So these relationships, we're just constantly trying to bring them closer and closer together so that we're not creating friction between us because there's a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And the more that you do it, the more they understand. So when we launched the new website, I got on the call to go through it with Dolly and, and she's laughing. And I'm like, what is so funny? She's like, oh, my God, when I read the website, I hear you in my head. <laughs> That's very cool, though, right? Because that means it did sound like you. It did. But also the fact that she knows me so well. She's like, oh, this is how Sarah talks all the well, time. That's perfect. So That's, that is so lovely. Now, yeah. um, we, we could talk about this all day, but we're not going to. Um, this has been great. I really enjoyed this. Um, for those of you that have enjoyed listening to Sarah and um, either you're going to be hearing this on the podcast, because I'm because uh, as you may have heard before, this is going to be a podcast episode on Friday as well with a little bit of an intro and outro. Um, Sarah and I are coming together again on May the 7th. She's been invited to run a masterclass workshop with me um, to do talk about how to eliminate the future stealers from your business so that you can maximize your time and make more profit. I really think those are the two big things that come out of it. Eh? And I just have a happier business life, life, life with business. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm really excited about it. It's, it's very practical. Um, there is a bit of a job to do. I have told my clients, look, if you're neurodiverse and you don't get all of it done, don't worry, she's not going to shame you. I've already told Sarah that I'm only going to do two days worth. Um, but um, Sarah does recommend if you do want to come be part of that, that you can, um, if you want to come and do part of that, that if you just like take a note for seven days before you come of where you're spending your time, just to kind of like make a note. It doesn't have to be 15 minute increments like a lawyer does of exactly what you've done every time, but just generally write a log of how you're spending your time so you can become a little bit aware. So you're ready to work hard in the workshop. Yeah, I think it's really just an awareness. We used awareness, to, isn't it? We just used to do six minutes, so it was like. Was it, yeah, actually, um, yeah. my first husband worked as a um, a what is it? An immigration consultant, yeah. and he used to, have to do six minutes, and I he did not like it. You know, I was the person yeah. that filled it in, like maybe at the end of the day, maybe at the end of the week, like, oh, what was I doing then? And what, um, so yeah, it's really about awareness, and this is yeah. about. I mean, people are like, I want to go there. And I'm like, cool, but where are you now? 
Yeah. It's really hard to give you directions if I don't know where you're at. It's like, yeah, Rachel, I'm lost. And they're yeah. like, oh, where are you? And I'm like, I'm lost. I don't know. I so don't know. Yeah. this is what that process is about is like, where are you now? Because everyone's problems are going to be slightly different. And we want to make sure that we're fixing the right problem. Because yes. it's a little bit like the virtual assistant problem. People think the virtual assistant will solve all the magical problems that you've got going on. But is it really the right problem that mm. we're solving? Or is it just someone told you a virtual assistant would be a good idea and they haven't fixed it? And so it's the virtual assistant's problem now. Same time. We want to make sure we're yeah, because I think one of the things that happens when you add someone into your team is it actually just highlights the areas of your of your business that weren't quite ready for them. Here are the things that aren't working. And yeah, like, oh. it's kind of like when you have a partner, you're like, oh, look how annoyed they are. Oh no, it's me that's annoying. Um, I'm I'm very aware of my annoyances with Rod, um, so that's okay. Oh. <laughs> I um, being married for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My our favorite one has to be the time that I, I I drove to work with my phone on the roof of my car because it was still working in sight. I couldn't find it in the car, but it, the music was still playing. So I was like, "Well, it must be in the car somewhere." So I drove, and he's like, "Out of all my ADHD things that I've ever done, that's the one that still irks him." Like that's just. <laughs> Well, I will bring it up to make him laugh. Like if we're like getting things a bit ADHD tense, I'm like, it's not as bad as the as the phone on top of the car. And he's like, oh no, no. Was it still there when you got to work? Yeah, it was still there. I've still got the same phone. Still got the same phone. Clearly, a very good driver though, because well, my I phone would be gone. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that if I had, if the music had stopped, I would have realized that the that it wasn't on the car. So the fact it did go fuzzy a few times. It must have been moving on the going backwards and forwards it was so bad anyway that was one of my ADHD highlights so anyway back to this so we'd love to have you join us on May 7th if you um, are part of my Facebook group um, or if you're part of my email list you get a discount code if you'd like a discount code to come even though it's amazingly priced you can send me a little note on LinkedIn or Facebook and I'll send you a sneaky little link um, otherwise um, Sarah it's been an absolute pleasure as always and I can't wait for May 7th it'll be amazing yeah it's gonna be so much fun so much fun. It'll be fun and thanks Di for con commenting Di you were the only one this time I don't know what everyone else were doing um, but so thank you for commenting because it was lovely to see you um, on here and thanks for everyone else for tuning in it was lovely thanks Sarah <laughs>